personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everyone. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Resistance Library Podcast. I'm here today with Sam Jacobs, and we're going to talk about the Spanish Civil War. Now, Sam, I had thought only America could have civil wars. <laughs> well, there's some debate as to whether or not America's Civil War was actually a civil war that I think is a, you know, a topic for another time, but is not, um, you know, n- not an entire, not a, not a theory without um, merit. So. Yeah, the Spanish Civil War is quite different. Um, we've talked about the Italian years of lead before. Mm. Um, I think that that is another interesting article. We link to it in the Spanish Civil War article. You definitely should read it. So everybody kind of refers to the Spanish Civil War as the dress rehearsal for the Second World War. Um, that is because the fascist regimes in Germany and Italy were equipping and funding the nationalist forces of General Francisco Franco against forces that were uh, largely funded, propped up, and armed by the Soviet Union. I think that we should right now address the question of whether or not the nationalist forces of Francisco Franco were fascist. Um, The answer is that some of them were though all of them were not. Um, I don't know if even the majority of them were. And the Generalissimo, the Caudillo, Francisco Franco, um, the Jefe, certainly was not. Um, Is it kind of just a rule that whoever fights communists becomes a fascist by, uh, by label? I think that there is something to that, but the whole like, well, how do you know which? How do you know that these guys were fascists? Well, because they a bunch of them called themselves fascists. A dead giveaway. So I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to their superior knowledge of what they believe about the world and say that yeah, the guys who call themselves fascists um, are probably fascists. And we're gonna get down into the nitty gritty of that a bit later. Um, I think that the kind of the thing to keep in mind as we go through this is how. Um, how the situation escalated to civil war, how quickly the situation escalated to civil war, and if you see any parallels to today. And I don't think that there's kind of any exact direct one-one parallels. We're living in a situation exactly like the Spanish Civil War. Um, I don't believe that, but I do think that there are some interesting parallels that are worth, you know, just kind of keeping in your mind and chewing over and looking for when you see them playing out in the world around you. So first there's a big difference. Spain has basically always been a monarchy and this was true until 1931. Um, there was a, the, 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 the Republic, the Spanish Republic that we're going to talk about here was actually the second Spanish Republic. Um, there was a very, very brief first Republic that was, uh, between eight, that existed from 1873 to 1874 you know, it didn't really affect Spanish history very much. It wasn't like um, the French one then. Right. No, it's nothing like that. In fact, I want to know the exact dates on that because I want to know if it's even a full year they got. The Spanish Republic existed from, yeah, it was almost two years. It was, so February 11th, 1873 to December 29th, 1874, before the Bourbon monarchs were restored. Um, There was that Republic and then, you know, the one that we're going to talk about, which started in in 1931. Um, Prior to that, there was a monarchy, which was kind of a monarchy in name only. It was basically a military dictatorship underneath a guy named Miguel Primo de Rivera y uh, Urbaneja. Uh, He was some aristocrat who also held military power and that fell in 1930 
King Alfonso the Thirteenth was king at the time. He was very, very unpopular, and he abdicated. This led to the Second Spanish Republic, whose constitution was drafted in 1931. This was a very leftist constitution, which you know, even to this day, Spain is a pretty conservative, uh, relatively speaking, country, and it was much more conservative and much more Catholic at the time. And so things like women's suffrage, compulsory universal education, nationalization of church property, civil marriage, prohibited the prohibition of Catholic religious orders from teaching in schools, banning of the Jesuit order. Um, Jesuits who famously were never really fanatical or or extreme (laughs) in their teaching. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, uh, I don't know how popular, relatively speaking, they would have been among Catholics in 1931. I mean, most mm-hmm. Catholics that I know today do not have a great deal of good things to say about the Jesuit order. Um, the Holy Father, the current Pope is a uh, is a Jesuit, and uh, <laughs> is he even a Catholic? <laughs> well, there's that. That's the question, isn't it? Um. So. Yeah, there. You know, any it could nationalize any property for the public good, and in this, it resembled the Constitution of Weimar Germany in that it was an attempt to kind of force a country to be radically left through uh, the the force of its constitution. The first election um, really entrenched the left parties in the country, but by 1933, the right. You know, this is a common. This is kind of like a common theme anytime that you read about the history of fascism or indeed uh, what we might call authoritarian, you know, non-fascist authoritarian governments. Um, another a very, very similar example would be um, the Pinochet years mm-hmm. of uh, Chile is that the left gets power and they go way, they really run with it. And the you know, if there's any kind of um, democracy or uh, popular sovereignty of any kind, you know, there's a pretty deep backlash that results yeah. in people much further to the right than were previously around. And this happens in Germany. This happens in Italy. This happens in Hungary. You know. It's why there's a rattlesnake on the Gadsden flag. It is indeed why there's a rattlesnake on the Gadsden flag. Um so, you know, the Conservative Party, uh, they won a plurality in Parliament, and they did not, but they did not win a majority. And so the left-wing president of Spain invited the Center Party to form a government. The Socialist government um, said that there was fraud, which caused them to be further radicalized. And um, the working, the kind of like the blue-collar working-class radicals on the ground, um, became increasingly hostile towards the left-wing government, partly because they just weren't getting their demands met because there was a centrist government in place with a left-wing president, uh, partly because the supposedly left-wing government violently suppressed, uh, I think it was a miners' strike. Uh, Monarchist forces who were backed by Benito Mussolini and kind of wink-wink, nudge-nudge, backed by King Alfonso XIII, were one of the main... Games on the ground for the right. Um, there also were, as I mentioned, actual ideological fascists led by a man named Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera. They were drilling, uh, which I believe was in violation of the law. And much as in the Italian years of lead, there were, you know, pitched street battles, 330 assassinations, 213 failed assassinations, 160 religious buildings destroyed. Spanish Civil War, uh, the Spanish Socialist Workers Party, which had formerly been a kind of like you know standard social democratic party of Europe, um, started to break between people who wanted to moderate that even further and people who were looking for something more explicitly Bolshevik. This is a common trend among the social democratic parties of the interwar period, uh, specifically the 1930s, the uh, Trotskyist movement built an entire 
strategy around this. It's called the French turn. They all joined social democratic parties uh, in the thirties with an eye toward splitting the radicals away from the more moderate party. Um, They weren't, you know, they didn't create this trend. They simply capitalized on it, but it was, it was that big of a deal. It was, it was a very big deal at the time. So everybody knows, you know, the war between the States, the civil war began with the attack on Fort Sumter prior to that, it was just kind of, you know, some saber rattling. And so the Spanish civil war begins with the coup d'etat of July, 1936. Uh, basically the entire Spanish right rose up. This included monarchists, nationalists, fascists who in Spain were uh, known as flangists and conservatives. The spark of the powder keg was the election of 1936. It was less than 1% of the vote, uh, gave a victory to a coalition of socialists, communists, and anarchists. Yes, anarchists used to run for office in Spain. I'm sure that they had, you know, good arguments for doing so. And they barely beat the right. The right wing in Spain stopped their strategy of trying to take over the Spanish Republic and just decided that they were going to get rid of it. The central government of Spain was very, very weak around this time and had been making attempts to purge suspect right wing generals from its rank. And General Francisco Franco was dictator of Spain until 1976. But he was removed, you know, so spoiler alert here, he, he wins. Um, but he was removed from his office as chief of staff, and they kind of put him out to pasture on the Canary Islands. And this um, is funny because it kind of bites them in the ass because he's now like, you know, has a base of operations to invade the country from. <laughs> um, but the nationalist rebels, uh, one of the big things that they had on their side was the unanimous support of the Army of Africa, who were 30,000 Moroccan Muslims. Uh, yeah, they were like the shock troops of the initial offensive against the Republican government. And they must have been told that the new regime was as anti-Muslim as it was anti-Catholic. They were specifically told that the that the republic was going. They were told that the republic was going to ban Islam. Huh. Um, whether or not that was true or just something that they were told, but yeah, like they they were ready to go once they heard that. So um, Spanish Morocco was kind of like their initial base of operations. Uh, General Franco and a general whose last name was Godet, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, took control of the Canary and the Balearic Islands. I probably said that wrong, too. Um, The colonial empire quickly became the base of operations. They went right out into the streets, rounded up all the leading trade unionists and leftists and executed them. The two trade unions in uh, the two big, two big trade union federations in Spain, one of which was explicitly anarchist, um, they offered to help the left wing government to crush the uprising. Uh, but it, you know, they were told, "Don't worry about it. Don't worry your pretty little head about it. It's just confined to Morocco and the Canary Islands and these places that don't really matter." Um, the coup was not a really huge success. They had thought that they were going to decapitate the entire state by doing this, and they didn't. Um, they didn't even capture any cities, which was a big problem for them because that, that those then became the centers of support for the Republican government. The Republican government indeed held most of Spanish, you know, mainland, peninsular uh, Spanish territory, but. There's two problems for the Republican government. First of all, the nationalist offensive split the territory of peninsular Spain in half. So there's 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 some land up north and there's some land down south that the uh, Republicans control and the nationalists have everything in the middle, which means anything you got to do, you got to coordinate between, you know, you, you, you get it, people. You're smart enough to follow what the problem with that was. Um the Republican government basically mobilized the far left as shock troops to terrorize the population into submission. Communists were like, you know, unleashed on the population. 
Um, clergy bore the brunt of this. Uh, they had a penchant for gang raping nuns, which I'm sure didn't win them a lot of hearts and minds. And they also were uh, into exhuming the uh, bodies of dead religious figure, figures with the purpose of desecrating their corpses. And this is what is referred to in history as the Spanish Red Terror. Um, there's a lot of romanticization about the Spanish Civil War among the left. Um, mm. You know, you can read, uh, like we were talking off camera before we started about uh, Homage to Catalonia, which is uh, George Orwell's book about his time in a militia, in a left-wing Republican militia in Spain during the, the Spanish Civil War, yeah. uh, which I strongly urge everybody to read. Yeah, uh, great book. Uh, he was sent there just to cover it, and within two pages decides to actually fight in it. It's, uh, it's quite a wild approach to journalism. You know, wasn't the world better when journalists had some balls? Yes, naturally. Um, no, it's just amazing now. I like the thought of Anderson Cooper uh, joining ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he already has, and he just thinks it's better to, you know, keep it on the low. But uh, <laughs> that, that's the that's the part of himself he keeps a secret. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and, and, and it'd be extra funny. If I... <laughs> you know what Anderson Cooper always reminded me of? You know those Weimaraner dogs? Yeah, yeah. He just looks like the human version of that. That's all I got about Anderson Cooper. So there's this like idea among. You know, the the left thing is always like, well, that wasn't real socialism. And it's like, well, wasn't it, though? Um, I think if there were people left living, it wasn't. I mean, it's like it's also the thing of like, you know, um, the largest communist party in the world is the Chinese Communist Party. Hmm. Um, let's go ask a bunch of them if they think what they're doing is communism, because I'm pretty sure they do. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're like, oh, no, it's just, a, you know, it's just a name. I think that, like, I mean, the, the you know, uh, Chi, is that G? Is that how the president's XI, that guy? Anyway. It's, it's like Mao Zedong. I mean, there's a thousand ways to translate these guys. Names. Yeah, so kind of like a rite of passage for the president of China or whatever the Grand Poobah of China is called, um, whether it's Mao or Deng Xiaoping or whoever it is. Uh, but you're kind of like expected to, this is a weird thing people don't know about China and Chinese government, but like you're kind of expected to write some, um, some like extensive tome on the eternal science of Marxism, Leninism. Hmm. Um, and that's your like that's your legacy, you know, when you leave. Cause like it, China has a very stable government. The president's not going to get shot in the back of the head. He's going to serve for 20 years and then. And then, and they, and they build these kinds of like generational, you know, handoffs into kind of the way their government is run there. Um, and one of the things that you're expected to do is like formulate, you know, what is, what does the eternal science of Marxism, Leninism say about yeah. the world situation of today? And uh, specifically to how, you know, how to build socialism in China and how, you know, it can be built around the world, though the around the world part is not nearly as much of a component as it used to be, say, 80 years ago, 50, you know, even 50 years ago. And yeah, he's, you know, like you, you study that in uh, in 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 China and, you know, the American, uh, the, 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 the Communist Party of the United States of America, which um, I would argue is, is basically just a, you know, Democratic Party operation. But, you know, they they read it. They study it. Um, it's it's not not communism because it does things that you don't like. Um, but with that being said, you know a lot of these kinds of like, well, that was they weren't doing real communism things. Uh, just, pff, hey, Joseph Stalin, what are you doing? Communism, buddy. Um, <laughs> they loved to like look at you know uh, the Spanish Civil War as like the time period when uh, real socialism tm is actually 
happening or at least something close to it Mm -hmm. um which just happened to be when they were gang raping nuns yeah and also like it's it's well that and like it's also you know it's very it's like very convenient that the only thing that you have to point to is this thing that existed for like three years and you know part of spain and even like i mean it's funny because if you read homage to catalonia you know the thing that i remember most about homage to catalonia is well first of all that one of the things that they would do was through a loudspeaker refer to their nationalist opponents with a uh disparaging spanish word for homosexuals uh routinely every night which i think is really funny because it's like uh these were not you know pc leftists by any stretch of the imagination (laughs) uh but also we're not gonna see that now huh no but also like orwell's disillusionment with the mo- with the movement because he especially with the with the stalinist you know the the moscow aligned groups cuz he kind of goes into it as you know like oh well you know i i obviously don't approve of what goes on in the soviet union but like these are just kind of you know disagreements between comrades and like and then by the end of it he's like he has to run from their secret police mm-hmm. you know and that was one of my one of the things i remember most about that book i best recall his shock at how inefficient spaniards were at warfare how the first word you would learn is tomorrow and that all the <laughs> rifles were encrusted in rust and they would just drink wine and, and kind of fire shots at each other's general directions every two hours and the and being covered in ice and then shooting the same unexplodable mortars back and forth at each other all day it was just quite a it was like it was like if the kids from Lord of the Flies had been asked to conduct national warfare. Yeah, and also like I the other thing I remember is the is the whole thing about the trains. Like they're never on time except for the one day that you're late. Yes. You stand around waiting for a train for two hours every time you need a train. Yes. Like one the, time, the one Swiss day you show up three minutes late, that train showed up. The Swiss and me itched when I read that. <laughs> You know how you summon a you know how you summon public transportation. It's a very uh very little known method of getting public transportation to arrive from mm-hmm. a bygone age. Light a cigarette. Ah, uh, yeah. It'll be right there. I swear. Sounds sounds crazy, but it works. Um Yeah, or if you want the principal to walk around behind the school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. God. So uh, one puff, and there she is, just materialized through the smoke like some kind of magician. Came through, came through the portal. You know yes. how hard it was to get a menthol Marlboro back then? Not not oh. at all, but I wanted it. <laughs> but anyway, I think this counts as digressing. So this yeah, the Spanish Civil War is like very romanticized. Um so let's talk about the Red Terror. Were they less bloody than, you know, Russia, China, and the Eastern Bloc? Well, yeah, they only had three years in part of Spain to do what they wanted to do. Um, The Red Terror in Spain predates the Nationalist Rebellion. It was actually one of the main motivators for the uprisings. It's generally believed that the Spanish Red Terror began during a minor strike in 1934. Uh, During the strike, which was also kind of a rebellion against the government, Clergy and religious figures were targeted. 58 churches and convents were destroyed in about two weeks. And the rebellion was put down by uh, Franco at the request of the Republican government. Once the rebellion began, the Catholic Church, um, and by the rebellion, I mean the Nationalist Rebellion in 1936, the Catholic Church, um, by which I mean not just the clergy, not just the religious uh, orders of monks and nuns, uh, but also, you know, the laity and people who are just faithful Catholics were kind of seen as fair game by supporters of the Republic. Hmm. Um, 3,400 priests, monks, and nuns were murdered during the first two months God. of the Spanish Civil War. Most of the deaths during the early months of the Spanish Civil War were not deaths on the battlefield, but were targeted execution of in giant air quotes, enemies of the Spanish Republic. A lot of really nasty incidents. There's a parish priest of a town called Naval Moral who was forced to go through the Passion of the Christ, which ended with a debate as to whether or not they should actually 
crucify him at the end. They did. They decided to show him mercy again in giant air quotes and just shoot him. Um, there was a priest who was thrown to fighting bulls and had his ear cut off. There was a priest who was castrated uh, and had his penis and testicles put in his mouth. Um, slight digression. ISIS did that to people at the Bataclan as well, by the way. Hmm. Um, thanks, Obama, for that. You should read our, well, we'll be talking about uh, how Obama helped that to happen in a couple weeks uh, on our Fast and Furious episode. Uh, people were forced at gunpoint to swallow their own rosaries. People were thrown down mine shafts or forced to dig their own graves prior to summary execution. Um, a Madrid nun for uh, a Madrid nun was executed after she refused a marriage proposal from a militiaman who participated in the sacking of her convent. Um, these were not good people. This is not like you know, and this is kind of one of my one of my operating theories about the world is that one of the reasons why the wars of the 20th century has been, have been as bloody as they were was because it was the first time in history where, where ideology was like involved in wars, uh, people fighting over a little bit of land, man, they might do some, they might do some nasty stuff, but people yeah. who fight because they think they're righteous and better than you. And what you think and believe makes you subhuman are much much nastier people. Um, and I think that we see that, you know, in all basically every war of the 20th century, um, 20,000 churches and religious sites were destroyed by the Republicans during the war. Big shock. Spanish Catholics were gung ho for Franco and his people. Um, <laughs> this is one of those like, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy things like mm -hmm. the Catholics are, sympathetic to franco well let's rape a bunch of nuns well now the catholics really like franco like no kidding um there were some conservative republicans like the conservative catalan nationalists but they were not gung-ho for the republic at all mostly because of the red terror which basically meant that unless you were like you know in one of the left block parties of the uh, popular front that like you were not a um, you were not you're lukewarm about this project. Um, anarchists, socialists and Trotskyists become targets once the capital C communists uh, allied with Moscow gain control of the interior ministry. This is also when all the militias are centralized. Um, and, you know, they do what communists do, which is start purging the wrong kind of leftists. Um, that is what we talked a bit about in the part in homage to Catalonia. Um, now let's talk about the white terror. There were atrocities committed by the Francoist forces. Um, I think that the um, Francoist forces engaged in war rape. Um, I don't believe that they did it as much as the Reds. I think any amount of it is wrong and should be condemned and is very, very bad. And the numbers are not interesting to me at all. Um, so I want to get that out there. But I also, you know, they, and also I think we, we, another thing they did that was really despicable um, was they would confiscate babies from Republican women that they were going to execute, um, which I, I'm finding a hard time uh, finding any justification for even during a time of war. Um, you know, conf I think they confiscated babies from, from like people they weren't even executed, which is like, that's really despicable. Um, I think that there's, I think that there's differences though. And I want to say, and I think that, I think that we, uh, it's incumbent upon us to discuss the differences. Um, you were way more likely to get a trial from Franco's forces than you were from the Republicans. You know, that's like, that to me is like kind of where the rubber meets the road on this. You know, I think that there's like, if you look at right wing authoritarian governments, I think that the, uh, the outlier here that we're, that we have to kind of like carve off from it to, to make this work is the Nazis. So like, Let's ignore the glaring, the glaring 
ways that this does that this doesn't apply to Nazis for a minute and just kind of work with me while I go through this. Um, yeah, the Nazis, there was no like, well, I'm not Jewish now. You know, there's no there's clearly like there's no way to do that. There's they, they had this 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 um, rather peculiar obsession with uh, people's you know, racial makeup, which which frankly did not exist in um in in fascist italy um i don't know enough about about hungary or romania or bulgaria or any of those kind of like you know b team players of the axis at the time um to say if they if they shared it but like um italy basically got strong armed by germany into rounding up jews for germany it was not a thing that they that they really wanted to do or had a great deal of enthusiasm for um, they did not have the Nordic, you know, Aryanist thing that the Nazis had that drove much of what they did. So let's include, let, let's say, like, I mean, I'll the even Italians say, like, would have been foolish to value racial purity quite so much after. What yeah, and, they, and it's, so it's exactly years. why they didn't. Yeah. It's exactly why they didn't. And there's like Italian fascist, you know, marching songs from the Ethiopia campaign that are basically like, go get yourself an Ethiopian wife, buddy. Hmm. you know like the italians were like they were aware like we have this very like you know kind of like mixed history and everything and so they didn't there was no like there's all kinds of criticism in the italian fascist movement of the of even like the idea that there's that there's a such thing as a racially pure italian they were much more focused on like are, are you a real man kind of stuff than like mm-hmm. are you are you a real italian um but in any in any event you know, I think that in in fascist Italy or Francoist Spain or Pinochet's Chile or, uh, you know, I don't know enough about it, but I would suspect that like in, you know, uh, when the Shah ruled Iran or like any of these kinds of, you know, client American client states of the Cold War period. Um, that like, as long as you shut your mouth and went about your life, I don't think they really cared what, you know, what, what lurked in your heart. Mm -hmm. Pinochet wasn't throwing everyone off helicopters then. No, right. Exactly. It wasn't like, it it wasn't, I mean, I know in the, I know like Pinochet is one of the ones I know the most about. Um, and Spain is the one of the ones I know the most about. And I know that like the common thread in both of those cases is like, if you were getting chucked out of a helicopter or you were getting thrown into like one of Franco's dungeons pending your execution, it was like you probably did something and you probably and and even if that something was saying things that you're not supposed to say, writing things that you're not supposed to write, mm-hmm. um you probably got a lot of warnings before you got thrown out of the helicopter. I mean, I know this is like, this is, it's weird. Cause it's like, it almost goes counter what I'm saying, but like in, you know, contemporary China, like they let you know in very stern terms, many, many times before they make an example out of you, you are given um, ample warning. You know, and it's like, and that's, that is, that's the outlier for leftism because the, 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 the typical, the typically authoritarian leftist country is like, we're just going to round people up and figure out what they did. You know, we don't like the look of this guy. We're going to get him and grab him and, you know, we'll figure out what we're going to prosecute him for later because we got enough laws on the books that there's going to be something here to, to, to charge him with. Yeah. And that's why there's no arguing your way out of it. But the more typical experience in 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 even the most authoritarian right wing countries, again, with the outlier, the outlier of Nazi Germany being kind of taken out of out of the equation is like, buddy, if you just shut your mouth, go to work and keep your head down, you know, we have bigger fish to fry. A very um, interesting difference and in, and. In- one you might really wonder about if you're not on either side, if you don't care whom you'd rather have pulling the reins. Well, look, I mean, I, I think that also like, you know, away from both of the, both of the extremes, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln at the end of the civil war is like a really good example of the, like, we don't like, we're not running, you know, 
we're not going to make people take ironclad oaths. We're not going to make people denounce this or that. You know, it's just like the war's over. It was a great tragedy for everybody. You know, we're going to we're going to lend a hand to our to our vanquished brothers kind of attitude, which was in stark contrast to the more radical Republicans who were like, well, we have to punish these people, you know, in the worst uh, way that we we can we can get away from. And I do think that it's like, I mean, maybe that's the real divide in politics. You know, people who can be kind of magnanimous in victory and those who uh, can't. So I, I don't actually think that the course of the war is like interesting at all. Um, there wasn't really, frankly, there wasn't a heck of a lot of a war. It was mostly just nationalist victory after nationalist victory. Um, the only real major Republican victory was during the Battle of Guadalajara. It was not even, that wasn't even an offensive. That was a successful repulsion of a nationalist attack. You know, they, um, there's not a lot, and they weren't even fighting the Spanish military then. They were fighting uh, volunteers from Italy. Hmm. Catalonia was the strongest base of support. Once that fell, it was over. Um, There were, you know, they still didn't have Madrid, but. It was most, they were just kind of mopping things up by about, I mean, kind of through the whole thing. But by 1939, it's over. Um, Franco declared victory on April 1st, 1939, which caused half a million Republicans to flee to France, where they were held in horrible internment camps by the French. Um, There were guerrilla fighters who fought against Franco into the 1950s which is pretty crazy. Um, there was a attempt by Republican veterans who were fighting with the French resistance to invade Catalonia from France in 1944. That lasted all of 10 days. So what's the relevance today? Um, well, I think that it's easy to overstate it, um, but let's kind of go through the bits and bobs here. Um America is intensely polarized politically. I don't think I need to tell you that. I'm sure everyone listening to this has lost at least one friend over the last five years because of politics, probably more. You know, that's not a normal state of affairs. And also, I think that there's there's very, very briefly, and I think that we should do a whole thing on this at some point, but there's a phenomenon known as illiberal democracy. Um this is where it's kind of used disparagingly, but basically the forms of democracy exist. Uh, but are used for anti-liberal means. And this is also, it's funny, because we're kind of approaching this, and that's the point at which, uh, you know, the elites start going, whoa, I don't know about this uh, free speech and democracy thing we got going on here anymore, because the plebs are, like, getting a little too much of what they want. Uh, But Poland, Hungary, um, basically the Visegrad countries in Central Europe are, like, really good examples of what we mean by illiberal democracy the other side of the equation from the um you know leftists gaining control of the state and handing out a billion dollars to fight racial injustice uh, among farmers which they're actually doing which you can read about on news.libertasbella.com which is a new site that i'm the managing editor of you know the flip side of the coin of that is like Um, to use him as an example of somebody who I think would be most, most radical in the execution of this. Um, what the hell do you think Ted Cruz is going to do if he becomes president? He's going to like fire everyone and replace them with Cruz people. And he talks pretty openly about this. And what that's going to mean is, you know, all kinds of things that the government does, the president can just start going, we'll stop doing that. Um, and, and most of this, and, and this is like, most of this is stuff that liberals like being done, but the president doesn't need to pass a law. He can just go stop doing it or do something else or whatever. And I think that among the right in America, there's kind of a increasing hostility, not towards democracy. This is where the left gets it wrong is they think the, the right is, uh, by and by the right i mean the international right you know that the right is like hostile towards democracy um and i just don't i don't think that that's the case i think that what the international right is hostile towards is liberalism and that what they've kind of figured out over the last 
I think mostly five years because I think that there's there's Trump, there's Bolsonaro, you know, um, there's Poland, there's Hungary, you know, the, Putin is kind of an expression of this, but but a earlier one, everything looks like Marina Le Pen is going to be president of France, and international right has kind of just gone well, like we can use democracy to like destroy liberalism and to tie it all in a neat bow. You know, the idea that like the right is going to do that and the left isn't going to ratchet up their game in response, I think is deeply flawed. The left ratchets it up and the right ratchets it up and, you know, and so on and so on. And there's nobody who like turns the screw back the other way and who will come out on top. I don't know. So if you go to ammo.com forward slash podcast, you can get $20 off any purchase of $200 of ammunition or more. We got pretty much every major caliber that you can think of, even some weird ones. If we don't have them, um, it's and if you're like, oh, you're not going to have 300 blackout, uh, go check because if we don't have it today, but we'll Tons. have it. In just a added of days. some subsonic to it yesterday. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, I mean, you just go to like, go to the website. If we don't have it today, check back a day or two later. Think You know how it is out there, guys. We blow, you know, it's like any other, we're just like a, like a, like your neighborhood gun store, except we're cheaper. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, if you go in there and you're like, hey, Bob, you got any 10 millimeter? Nope. Just sold out of it. Same deal. But we'll have it back in like two days. So ammo.com forward slash podcast. Uh, We'll get you $20 off any order of $200 or more. I am Sam Jacobs for Sam, uh, for for Sam Trello, (laughs) for Dave Trello. And this has been the Resistance Library Podcast from ammo.com. We'll see you next time.